Hello, I'm here to talk about my Andrew Weatherall vinyl collection. And before I start, just a brief background. I've been a DJ for most of my life, been collecting vinyl most of my life. And I have thousands and thousands of records in my collection that I've just picked up myself over the years and picked up through various record and DJ pools I've been in on account of me being a DJ. There's just a lot of records that I have and I'm trying to think if there's any other artist in my collection where I have a larger volume of vinyl than Weatherall. I think Weatherall accounts, in terms of a single artist, I think Weatherall accounts for probably more records than any other artist in my collection. I have a lot. Those of you who buy those U-Haul small boxes, you know, they're perfect for records. And they hold about... 80 to 90 a piece and I've got over two boxes stuffed of Weatherall related releases so there's a lot. I'm not going to go through all of them today. I'd be here for fucking hours if I did that. So that's not my goal. I'm just going to go through some of the Weatherall records that I are you know records that I'm very close to and that mean a lot to me personally and there's a lot so just narrowing it down to what I will talk about is hard enough. Um but yeah, uh, Weatherall was a huge influence for me musically. Most of you probably know Weatherall died earlier this year in February, so it's been about six months since he's been gone. And that it's it's been a tough one. Weatherall not being here anymore is just weird. Over the years, I've always sort of, not sort of, I've always followed his career very closely. I mean, since 1990, essentially. I've always been... Uh, checking the web, checking webs, the you know, checking the web for his records, checking various sites for new remixes he's done or any productions he's had his fingers on. There's just so much stuff. It's you know, again, to cover it all would be too long and too arduous. Um, I, sh I shouldn't say arduous. I probably have a connection to everything he's ever done. I can't think of a single time I heard a Weatherall related record that I didn't like. I think I like everything he's ever done. So some less or so, but most everything he's ever done has been really solid, inspired work. So without further ado, um, yeah, Weatherall was one of those guys who inspired me as a DJ in terms of him just being a varied artist. He could go from playing a deep house set to playing a techno set to a hip hop set, ambient set to a rockabilly set. He just loved music, and you can hear it through his his productions and his in his own music, his own artistry as as a musician came through, and and tons of his records too. He started off as a remixer primarily, and then he gradually went over to uh, producing his own stuff, and got to the point where he just was so busy doing both that he was an extremely prolific artist. He's got tons of stuff out there. You can't even. He can't even count everything he's done. I don't have everything he's done. I have almost everything, which is a lot. But he was a very, yeah, he inspired me as a DJ just because he loved music. He was inspired by many different things as well, not just electronic music, which is primarily what he always did. Almost only, that's all he did. He had a couple, he had a phase in the late aughts where he did, he had a rockabilly phase, but even that was electronic inspired, so... But that just what that wasn't all he did. He liked he he came from like a post punk background and punk background and industrial background and he mixed that with techno and house and trip hop and hip hop and every other genre tag you want to think of. Whether all you know, whether all dipped his toe in those waters. You name a genre, he probably had something to do with it. And as a DJ he, in my opinion, probably was the best DJ of all time simply because he knew his records, he knew his music. And as a DJ myself, I know that's the most important skill to have as a DJ is knowing your records, knowing when that break comes, knowing when the end is coming, knowing when those drum patterns down die down into a more uh, mellow area where you can mix something else in mixing another song in that fits with the record you're currently playing. He just mastered that. He was a master at it. And also just being varied. I know, I know calling someone a master of variation is, 
I don't know, probably a pretentious thing to say, but he was. He just had that talent to uh, take whatever he was doing and mixing and producing and writing and make it his own and then make it fit into this other area that didn't necessarily make sense on the surface. He'd take a, a techno track and mix it with a rock track and all of a sudden these two ideas, these disparate ideas were mingling and it worked. Not a lot of people could do that. And Weatherall was one of the first to do it. And through the years, he was one of the best to do it and make it work. A lot of people try to do it, but they don't do it as seamlessly with as much fluidity as Weatherall did. And in the, in the record community, he meant a lot. I, I've noticed some of the new records I've been buying in the last, you know, couple months since he died, I'm starting to see dedicated to Mr. Weatherall, dedicated to Andy Weatherall on them. I'm seeing that several times so far. And there's good reason. Him dying was a big, a major shockwave in the world of music. He just was, he was a, he was a major influence for, for people of all types of genres. So look him up if you haven't. I assume most of you will end up being here because you know who Weatherall is. Um, anyway, without further ado here, I will, uh, I will talk about my experience with him and where it started. My, my intro to Weatherall started in July of 1990. I was at a Depeche Mode concert, of all things, and uh, Knights of Reb, the opener, had just finished their set. Another band I'll talk about at some point. As well as Depeche Mode, maybe I'll talk about them. I have everything both those bands have done. But before each band comes on, as most of you know, when you go to a show, they'll play like a mixtape or they'll play music by artists that inspired them, and then they'll come on. Uh, before Depeche Mode came on, there was a song playing. And it was an outdoor show. I was down in Los Angeles when I saw it. And the sun's beating down. It's a hot day. And this song comes on over the PA. And it just stops everybody in their tracks. Everyone is like, what the fuck is this? This is amazing, whatever this song is. I still remember it to this day. It's been 30 years. So we're all standing there being like, what the fuck? This is amazing. And this woman behind me, she's like, oh, this is the Happy Mondays. This is the name of this song's Hallelujah. I'm like, okay, Hallelujah, Happy Mondays. And I knew of the Happy Mondays a little bit. Um, back in the late 80s MTV 120 Minutes days, I knew a couple of their songs, but not enough to know much about them. It's certainly not enough to know what any of their albums or singles were called. But I was like, okay, happy Mondays. Hallelujah. Need to remember that. And she goes, this is the Andy Weatherall mix, though. Make sure you make that distinction because the original mix sounds a lot different. So I was like, okay, happy Mondays. Hallelujah. Andy Weatherall. Got it. So after the Depeche Mode show, which was fantastic, by the way, Depeche Mode Violator era, come on, doesn't get much better than that. I came home to Portland, Oregon, and I went to the record store that very day, maybe, when I got home, probably the next day. So within, within a 24-hour period, I didn't waste a lot of time. And I picked this up, the Ray Vaughan EP. This was my intro to Weatherall, and I can't think of a better way to start. In addition to the Happy Mondays being a brilliant band, and I'll talk about them at some point as well, whether on, and also Paul Oakenfold is on this, is credited to this too. I don't know who remixed what or who dominated the remix, if, if it was more Weatherall or more Oakenfold, it's a mystery, but this was the first time I ever picked up a Weatherall related record. And to this day, this, this, remix is one of the greatest examples of rock music marrying dance music and making it okay. Back in the late 80s, this just, just, it wasn't as common for this to happen. Rock and dance intermingling and working together. At least for me, that's the way I remember it. But this was a big sea change moment for me, at least. And it seemed like musically as well in general. I read a lot about this in the music papers at the time, and this was a big this was a big deal, and for good reason. All of a sudden, it was with this single, it was okay for 
rock people to enjoy dance music and vice versa, dance, you know, rave kids listening to rock. All of a sudden it was like, oh, okay. Weatherall's on a Happy Mondays record. This works. It just works. Trying to describe the track is hard. It, it's just a dirty indie dance track with influences of punk and disco and experimental vibes that you can't define. Even to this day, it sounds unique. This was a big moment. I remember it being a very large moment, not just for me, but in the annals of music history. This was a huge deal. That's how I started off with my Weatherall love affair. It all started right here with this very record. I still have it. Well, I still have all my stuff, but this was a huge record. And after that, I became obsessed with Weatherall and everything he did. I had to seek out everything he did. And this was my next foray into the world of Weatherall. This is that Patrol Emotion. And this is a this is a U.S. promo EP. It doesn't have a title. Um, that Patrol Emotion was a indie rock band. Another another great band that I'll cover at some point. I think they were Irish. Pretty sure they were Irish, and the singer was from Seattle. So the singer was American. This came from the majority of these tracks came from their Chemic Crazy album that came out in '89, which is a great album in itself. But this featured some remixes, and one of them was from Andy Weatherall and Terry Farley, called the Boy's Own Mix. Uh, Terry Farley, it was Farley and Heller, and Weatherall had a fanzine called Boy's Own. It was a magazine about dance culture, and then they later went on to form the uh, the label Junior Boy's Own, that would put out records from Underworld and um, a number of other great electronic groups. But this was my second time into the world of Weatherall, and I think this might have been his first remix he ever did. Date-wise, this came out in 89, so I don't see a lot of things with Weatherall's name on it from 89, uh, other than the Happy Mondays. But this is the second foray into Weatherall. And again, it was um, a rock band, a rock song being turned into a, an electronic thing. Uh, but this, this was... Uh, like the the Happy Mondays was more of a kind of a disc a dark disco vibe. This one was more down tempo hip hop roots reggae flavored mix. It's a down tempo rock song anyway, and they basically just turned it into like a dub version, with with the vocals still intact. Usually, dub infers that the vocals have been dubbed out, but not here. I mean, dub in the terms of roots reggae. So another great remix, you know, in my mind, it was like Weatherall's batting two for two, as far as I'm concerned. Happy Mondays on top of this. Another great example of, of rock music meeting dance music, and it just works all over the place. I don't know if this was the third thing I got, but this was this came out the same year. And this was in terms of rock you know, being a, a good example and a testament of Weatherall dipping his toe into the rock and roll world is the My Bloody Valentine Glider EP. This is, one side has the original version of Glider, then the other one has the Weatherall mix. The My Bloody Valentine original is great, and they had been around for a couple years as it was. Known to be the rock band they were, or shoegaze. I'm not a big fan of that term. We all know My Bloody Valentine, what they sound like and what their vibe was. Weatherall took that vibe and again, sort of like like the That Patrol Emotion mix, turned it into this down-tempo, you know, some hip-hop samples on it, some hip-hop vocal samples. It's a really simple mix, really, when you listen to it. Uh, there's not a ton of complex stuff going on. However, he does just enough to, when you hear it in a club, it just... I can remember hearing this in the club at the time, and it was a huge sound, and just something that people weren't used to hearing. Again, rock bands didn't get this sort of treatment back then. This uh, rave meets down tempo meets techno meets roots. It just didn't really exist. There's some bands that were doing the whole rock dance crossover thing, like The Shaman did it pretty well with Intact. You know, there were some bands that did it, but 
Whether I was hitting something, it was something unique and new and people were hearing it. Another great example of how Weatherall did that. Excellent single. And the My Bloody Valentine original is great too, you know. I, I probably don't need to describe how great Loveless is. This was another early Weatherall remix that I love and still sounds good today. This is Perpetual Dawn. This is the US version. It's got a it basically has all the mixes on it. The UK back then had a weird tendency to, you know, a record label would produce a ton of remixes for something and then you'd have to buy two or three different uh, editions to get the, uh, to get all the mixes. But the US usually just put them all on one, one single and they did that here and it's got both weather all mixes on it. This is again, a very dubbed out dance excursion mix dub and disco and house and techno with a huge you know rumbling jaw wobble bass line and you're getting close to what this sounds like and even that doesn't do it any justice at all these are some of weatherall's finest remixes he ever did can't recommend this one enough find if you find this pick it up this came out in 1991 this is another random example of where I thought Weatherall did an excellent job of uh, sort of just having a very unique sound. And I, I didn't love this at the time when it came out. I've, I've listened to it recently. Oh, this is um, West India Company. The name of the song is Oje Zouezoul. I don't have any idea if I'm saying that right. I probably fucking mangled that all over the place. Apologies. But... This has got two remixes, one by Weatherall all by himself and another one he does with uh, Alex Patterson of The Orb. They both sound very similar. The, the Orb mix has some more vocal, like some more corny vocal samples on it that sounds, you know, The Orb tends to use funny vocal samples on their, on their tracks and it, it's got a more Orby vibe, but both tracks are very similar. The album this came from is very dated. I wouldn't say it's great. I listened to it recently. I didn't love it at the time, and I didn't love it recently when I heard it. It was okay. But the mixes here are good. This came out in 1990, some early weather all. I would, I would recommend picking this up. It's dated well. It's got a very Balearic, you know, down-tempo house vibe, distant-sounding drums. Very dated, but very current at the same time. There's been kind of a Balearic revival in recent years, and... This is a good one. Excellent mixes here. Weatherall's kind of finding his footing on this, these kinds of records. You can hear it. His production methods are getting better and more sound and solid. This is another example of that. The Meat Beat Manifesto Psych Out single. This is the US edition. Again, this came out in the UK and all the mixes were spread across different versions, but this US edition has five mixes all really good. The three on the A side are all by Jack Dangers himself. I'll cover Meat Beat Manifesto at some point too. Another sick ass group that just killed it, killed it every time they put anything out. The B side has the two other all mixes and he did these with Thrash of the Orb. Thrash was one of those guys who was around the first few years of the Orb and then disappeared. I guess I interviewed, uh, I used to work for Discogs and I, I interviewed Thomas Fellman and I didn't I didn't print a lot of it, but he had a lot to say about Thrash. Thrash lost his mind at some point, I guess. He got literally got mental and uh went crazy on the band. I don't know. All I know is that his his productions are top notch. UF Orb is the Orb's greatest album, and Thrash had a lot to do with that. But at any rate, Weatherall and Thrash do these two down-tempo, skanked-out, dub house mixes. Excellent. Can't recommend this record enough. Or anything you find from Meat Beat, by the way. If you find anything from Meat Beat, just pick it up. But that one in particular is a good one. Meat Beat and Weatherall on the same record? How do you? How can you lose with that? You, you can't. I hold this up. This isn't one of my favorites. It's New Order, World, World in Motion. This was their World Cup theme in 1990. I hold this up just because it's New Order, who's a big band, obviously. And then Weatherall. This is the first time Weatherall 
remix them. He would remix them a number of times over the years. This was the first time. Uh, these are mixes I think he did with, yeah, Terry Farley. He did these with Terry Farley. Another boys' own mixes. Um, these are okay. They weren't great then. They're not great now. They're fine. They're ravey, kind of cheesy, dated, you know, electronic stuff, dance stuff. Lots of piano stabs and, you know, things you'd hear in a kind of a top 40 club in, in the early 90s. Nothing, nothing groundbreaking, but good. Um, so I'm going to hold this up. This came out in 1992. I'm skipping ahead a few years here. Again, he did a lot of solo work that I could talk about all day, but I'm not going to do that right now. I hold this one up. This is just one of my favorites. This was, I remember this being kind of a, a moment where Weatherall started employing a different vibe with his music. Um, he did two mixes here. This is the promo of this, Afro Jazz Jam and the Potless Mix. Those are both Weatherall. I think the Potless Mix was the only one on the commercial release. Um, in fact, I think I have a, there's a press sheet with this. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't specify which one was on the commercial release. But anyway, I think it was the Potless Mix. But these are excellent remixes. He, um... His production style changed. This was like a progressive house vibe, but production on here is really tight, really good. The production on his early stuff is a little, you know, I don't want to say archaic, but it's um, very simple. Lots of samples. You can hear them. The production style isn't great, but it's inspired at the same time. But this is when he started really getting inspired and showing off some production prowess that would only get better and better and better. These are really, really unique and cool mixes. Afro Jazz Jam is kind of a down-tempo jazzy thing, and then the Potless mix is like this big, bottom-heavy, progressive house chugger. This is a good one. As, indeed, everything Weatherall did. These are some of my favorite Weatherall remixes. I got the 7-inch stuffed in here. Um, yeah. Anyway. The Jungle Bill mixes. And this this single is significant not only because the mixes are phenomenal, both, but this was the first time I remember seeing the Savers of Paradise written on anything. That's when he joined, or Jags Cooner and Gary Burns joined him, I guess. They were in a band called The Aloof, another band I'll cover. Um, this was the first time I remember seeing the Savers of Paradise written on anything. And, man... These mixes are fucking sick. Love the just two mixes that take just this. This is a great illustration of what whether whether I was so brilliant at. He could take just one snippet or one element of a song and extend it into this huge extended, um, you know, massive d disco excursion, and he does that on this. Both mixes are like eleven minutes. One's yeah, one's eleven and a half, and the other one's eleven. He takes, and the original of Jungle Bill is excellent. Yellow is another band I'll talk about and is classic and great. And you need to buy everything from if you see it. But he just took this one simple kind of, you know, odd pop jam and then turned it into this, you know, turned it into 23 mi minutes of mixes, basically. And yeah, these are some of my favorite Weatherall related remixes ever. Just really inspired, creative, alien sounding dance music a lot of dance music is a little is more minimal or more focused on a, a piano line or a vocal but this he just completely reconstructed the track in fact this this mix is unique in that i remember reading an interview with weatherall where he mentioned that dieter meyer the singer of yellow said these are good mixes but you need to be making your own music mr weatherall you've got too many ideas and you're too varied and as great as your remixes are, you need to be doing your own shit. And he took that advice. He started releasing his own stuff shortly after these mixes. Um, I'm going back in time to 91 a little bit. I don't know if I even need to hold this up. Primal Scream, Screamadelica. This is unique in that it was the first album that Weatherall produced. Other than just a remix. He was really just known for remixes and DJing. But this is the first time he produced another band. And this album, again, I don't know that I even need to talk about this. This is huge. One of the 
biggest albums ever. He didn't produce the whole album though. As most of what Primal Scream does is it's sort of a it's a it's a you know a collection of people coming together to unite one idea. But this is the first time they did it. He, but again, Weatherall doesn't produce everything on here. He like you know like Moving On Up was produced by uh, was it J Jimmy Miller of uh, Rolling Stones fame. I think it was Jimmy Miller. I think that's his name. Um, George, no, not George, but Jimmy Miller. George Miller's a director. Anyway, uh, Slip Inside This House was produced by Hugo Nicholson, who was another guy who was around at the time, dance guy, great produ great producer, worked with people like Julian Cope. But for the most part, he, he produced the rest of this. Uh, he didn't produce Higher Than the Sun. The Orb produced that. Man. Higher Than the Sun, oh my god. I could do a whole video on that song. Uh, Higher Than the Sun is, is the greatest song on here, and quite possibly... No, not possibly. Higher Than the Sun is the best single of the 90s. Period. It just is. And that's all Orb. I'll talk about them at some point, too. If you've never heard Higher Than the Sun, man, stop wasting time and pick that up. Higher Than the Sun. Anyway... This is, this is a cool album. I, I, this was everywhere at the time. You couldn't get away with it. You can't get away from it. But I never loved the album. I was never as enthusiastic as it, a lot of other people were. And listening to it nowadays, I feel the same. It's good, but not my favorite. It's, it, albums that sound like a collection of singles always sort of... It's hard for me to take in. Screamadelic is a great album to listen to per track, but listening to it all in one go is kind of a slog for me. It just feels like a... I don't know. It feels like a collection of singles. There's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't quite flow as an album. But anyway, I'm rambling. I'm digressing. This album was very important in terms of whether all further marrying that idea of rock and dance being together into this united whole. Screamadelica was the first album that really did that and did it credibly and amazingly, creatively, and awesomely. It's a good album, don't get me wrong. I, I, I think it's slightly overrated, but still good. So the second album he did that with was this, One Dove, Morning Dove White. And there's a lot of hype with this album, and particularly in the UK, because Weatherall was just known to be this the man with the golden touch. Everything he touched was just amazing. And this was the first album he sat down and produced every track on. And again, like Screamadelica, I feel the same way in that this was a collection of singles more than it's a cohesive album. For instance, if you're paying attention, you, there's eight tracks on this album, five of which were singles, three of which were produced came out before this album. So when you bought this album, almost half of the songs you'd already heard. So it was hard to listen to this album and not sense some regurgitation to it. It's a great album, don't get me wrong, but again, for me, it's better listened to as a, as a collection of singles more than one flowing album. It's good. And whether all, and you know, the Sabres definitely show off their production prowesses with this, prowess with this album, but Again, it's it's a slog to sit through and listen to in one sitting. But at any rate, this album was, um, you know, hugely hyped in the UK. And when it came out, it got great reviews. And I always thought that, well, maybe some of that is hype. People are buying into the hype. Something is hyped and there's so much momentum behind something. It finally comes out and you can't help but be excited and left in wonder about this this thing that you've been reading about for so long, but I remember listening to him being like, yeah, it's pretty good, but I've heard better, better weather all. I'll go through the one dove singles. This is fallen. This came out earlier on Soma records records, which is slams label. I have that not here. Weather all's not on that anyway. So, but this is the first time weather all popped up on a, on a one dove record. Um, Basically got the album version here, except the version here is one minute longer, but essentially it's the same mix. Got a Farley Heller mix on the B-side. Uh, this was the second single taken from that album, Transient Truth. 
the promo, boring promo cover. Album version on side one. Side two has the old toys mixes, which are Savers of Paradise mixes. Uh, the original is basically a 100 BPM sort of uh, dub skank with some sexy vocals by Dot Allison. Great track. And then the Sabres on the B-side turn these old toys mixes into like a 130 BPM techno thing. Good mixes. Excellent mixes. And it also came with a promo 12-inch accompaniment, the Sabres of Paradise mixes, with four additional Sabres of Paradise mixes on them. Again, whether I took one snippet of a song and just extended it into its own mix, you get six total mixes if you get both versions of this single. I would highly recommend getting the Savers of Paradise remix version. Those mixes are really, really solid inspired stuff. And, you know, if you get both 12 inches too, you're getting a full album's worth of remixes and they're all similar but different. Worth having. This was the third single from that album, White Love. Weather All's all over this. Again, the album versions on this you didn't know it at the time. You bought the single and then later it came out on the album in the same form, which is kind of a bummer, at least for me. It does have a Weatherall dub, though, which is excellent. And then it also comes with this remix EP. I've got both versions stuffed in here. Um, it has two slam mixes, which are epic. One's like 15 and a half, yeah, and the other one's 17 and a half. It goes from fast to slow, fast, slow. Tons of slam mixes here. And One Dove had that Soma connection, so I don't doubt that maybe One Dove reached out to them and said, hey, come remix us. This is the U.S. promo edition of White Love. This has the Weatherall mix, one slam mix, and then two mixes that are only on this U.S. one. One's by Stephen Haig, and then the other one was by Scott Hardkiss. Good mixes. They're more just clubby house versions, but good. The Hardkiss mix doesn't sound anything like the original really and I never was a hard kiss fan I always thought he was insanely overrated but his mix here is good he brings it on this one this was the next single the fourth single breakdown this is an excellent single William Orbit is on the mix here and then Sabres do a dub I think it's called Squire Black Dove Rise Out Rides Out yeah Squire Black Dove Rides Out um really good mix both William Orbit always brought it too. He was insanely talented. The uh, the uh, runner of Gorilla Records, tons of great records on that label. It also came out as a promo with some Secret Knowledge mixes on it. Secret Knowledge was Chris Needs. He was a grew up as a writer, a music writer, and then turned into a DJ and a music producer in his own right. He was okay. I was never a huge fan of Chris Needs stuff. He has some good stuff, but I. Never really went out of my way to find his things. This was the fifth and final single from the album, Why Don't You Take Me. This is a great single. This commercial version has two B-sides and then an Underworld remix. The Underworld remix is really good. This is a ballad. This song is a ballad. And then the Underworld turns it into a, kind of this progressive slow, 110 BPM progressive house Thing. And it also came out on a remix EP, as most of their stuff did, with another Underworld mix on it and a Secret Knowledge mix. The Secret Knowledge mix is boring, in my opinion. Just my opinion. It's kind of sped up trance song. I don't know. It sounds nothing like the original. The Underworld mix, though. Oh my god. 15 minute, like, kinetic techno jam it's again it sounds nothing like the original but it doesn't matter it's so good it's just like it's just like an underworld track with this tiny snippets of the original one dub version but man the, the, the underworld up two down mix fucking good stuff check that one out and then this i hold up just as a curiosity um this has got the full version of my friend on it this is a uh, united states of ambience 2 United States of Ambience too. The version of My Friend on Morning Dove White is only six minutes. It's nine minutes here. This is the full version. Why they edited it on the album, I have no idea. All the tracks on the album are 
with the exception of a few or like eight or nine, 10 minutes. Why they felt the need to edit it, I don't know. This version is definitely better. It's full, the full version. It's, it sounds more complete. I've ripped all these records and sort of made my own album mix and the album definitely flows better with this longer version. Just my opinion, but check this out. Uh, I don't know how, I don't know how rare any of these are, by the way. Maybe I should look these up before I pull them up on Discogs and figure that out. But um, I, I'm assuming the singles probably aren't that hard to find. The album probably would be. I don't know that it's ever been re reissued. Okay, so moving along here. I'm going to hold this up just as a curiosity piece because Weatherall was known to record under all kinds of different names. But this is the Steve Bicknell remix EP. And he, Weatherall appeared as Lords of a Ford on this. He, he worked as Lords of a Ford with Dave Hedger, who was Inner Sphere. Weatherall would later create his own label, Sab Sabres of Paradise. It's like the name of his band, which I'll get to. But I hold that up because that was one of his names that he recorded under, Lords of a Ford. This is another great single he put out, uh, Meek. He named himself after Joe Meek, the electronic extraordinaire from the 50s and 60s. This is Joe Meek knob twiddling right here. This is just, this came out, oh, this came out on New Ground Records. Cone Melt's label. Cone Melt. Another group that I will talk about. Cone Melt. These guys, oh, so good. I'll, I look forward to talking about them. Totally unique sound, uh, great producers. They came, they produced a, a slew of great albums and singles and then just disappeared. But fucking great band. Anyway, this is on their label. And this is just two tracks of like very nudely alien sounding techno. A testament as to how varied Weatherall could be. Really good stuff. This is, excuse me while I fumble around with some records here. My apologies. Let me pull some stuff out here. This is another great example of something that I love. Now, whether I could take a track and turn it into something completely different with a different vibe, and yeah, he does. He does three mixes of everything. The, the single was ground level. That was the, what they were promoting. But then Weatherall came in, Sabers came in and produced uh, everything. Did three mixes lasting almost a half an hour, and basically they took this hip pop single from Stereo MC. That's not a slam either. I love Stereo MCs. Love these guys. The album that this comes from, Connected, is fucking brilliant. But they took this brief hip-hop song and turned it into this extended psychedelic techno jam. And, man, it's good. I can remember at the time seeing an interview with the head from Stereo MCs, and he'd heard the mixes that Weatherall had done, and he was like, I don't understand what he's doing here. It doesn't sound anything like the original. I heard. I remember reading an interview with him later, five or six years later, going, yeah, I get it now. I see what Weatherall was doing. And that, that was Weatherall's habit. He kept people guessing. You, you couldn't predict whatever what he was going to do next. And what he did was he took a genre, he took a whole culture of music, and he transformed it into another culture. And before you knew it, both cultures were intermingling just a little bit closer, more closely. And that's the kind of thing he did. He did it on this record. He did it really well. One of his best, one of his better remixes, in my opinion. This is really, really excellent stuff. Okay, so I'm going to get into The Sabres of Paradise. This is his band on his label, the first single. It all started here, his own productions. Not producing anyone else, not remixing anyone else. It started here, Smoke Belch. This is a cover of Lamont Booker's, I can't remember the, I don't know if the original is called Smoke Belch. I don't think that it is. This is a cover, though. The melody, if you listen to the original version by Lamont Booker, it's the same thing. It's, um, I wouldn't say he apes the melody, but you can definitely hear it. I remember when I heard this at the time, this, this is a great single in its own right, don't get me wrong, but I, when I heard the Lamont Booker original years later, I was like, oh, that's the exact same melody. But this is a great song either way. Weatherall started it all right here. 
This there's a great remix EP. It's got a yellow cover instead of red. It's the same cover as the same logo here with the swashbuckling swords, but it's yellow. Anyway, this is where the Savers of Paradise started. The David Holmes mix might be better, which is impressive. It's hard to take a song that's really, really great and make it better. Holmes killed it on that one. I highly recommend picking that one up. And by the way, what happened to David Holmes anyway? He used to be like the man when it came to like techno and intense electronics and dance music and I don't know, last 20 some years he's just been making shitty soundtrack music for Steven Soderbergh movies. I don't know. I guess, hey, he's making a living. I can blame him, but damn. Holmes, come on, man. Give us that techno magic again. Fuck that Soderbergh shit. He's made like two or three good movies in his career. Come on now. That's just my opinion, all right? I'm full of dumb opinions. Argue with me if you want, but Soderbergh, come on. He's overrated. This is not overrated. This is a great album, Saber Sonic on Warp Records. This is a... I use the word weird a lot, and I'm, I, I try to be self... I'm kind of self-conscious about it. This is a weird record, though. There's really no other way to describe it. It's got techno, it's got house, ambient, dub. It, but it's it's spooky. Like, there's a track on here called Clock Factory. I guess it's ambient, but it's very strange. It's like a, a song you'd hear in a haunted house or something. It's just kind of a spooky song with spooky vibes. But this was Weatherall's first album he made with anybody. Got a great cover here. What a great uh, logo. Highly recommend picking this up. Um, phenomenal start to anyone's career. Saber Sonic. Get that album. And then there is a... They put this out like a year later. Saber Sonic 2. It's got a collection of B-sides from singles they put out around then. Like Theme and Wilmot. Um, it's got the Holmes remix on here too. It's got the Beatless mix of Smoke Bell. It's just kind of a slightly rearranged version it's got different versions of some album tracks and remixes and B-sides and worth having if you're a Sabres fan for sure. Or if you're not a Sabres fan, it's worth having. This is their second album, Haunted Dance Hall. Mm. This is sick. What goes on in this album defies description. You get... I, I don't know what you get. Just listen to it. It would be a disservice for me to try to describe this. This is a fucking crazy album. All kinds of vibes, all kinds of moods. Out of this world production. It lives up to its haunted title again. It's just strange. Music you'd hear in a bad dream, but inspiring and really uplifting all at the same time. It's, tons of emotions go on when I hear this album. Maybe it's when it came out. It came out in 1994. I was a young pup then, but man, I remember back then when I heard this when I was, I don't know, 20 or whatever. It blew my mind. It blows my mind today. It's just a mind-blowing album in every way. Got to pick that one up. Um, ooh. Oh. Oh, yeah. James versus the Sabres of Paradise. Jam J. This is... An unbelievably strange record. You you just you can't comprehend how awesome this record is until you hear it. It's beyond description. It is 33 minutes. It's one song split into two sides. Obviously, it's a record. But if you listen to it all in one, which is as it's intended to, it'll blow your mind. It's just experimental dub indie mash it's like he just he, he literally took a, a pot of stew and threw it all the genres and everything he could into the mix and just shat it out and it ended up as this and i mean that as a compliment this is a fucking awesome record any record that defies description you need to need to listen to it and this does james versus jam j james versus savers of paradise jam j is the title sorry I'm getting excited every time I talk about that record, man. It's uh, just thinking about it as an inspiring experience. Oh, okay. Um, let me find... Dig, 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 dig. 
Ding, 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 ding. This is a remix EP they put out for the Haunted Dance Hall album. It's got LFO on it. Anything with LFO on it's worth it. Depth Charge, you you pick that up. If you see LFO and Depth Charge, you, you pick that up. There's, there's more bands I'll talk about at some point in the future. LFO was also on Warp. Uh, Mark Bell, he ended up producing uh, Bjork. He's dead now, too. He died. Fucking young, too, man. I can't remember what he died of. Anyway, he's not here anymore. Bummer. This. Holy shit. Flowered up Weekender. I'm going back a little bit. This came out in 1992. But this is a testament to Weatherall bringing it. He takes... Every time Weatherall did a remix at this time, he had it had to be like a grand statement. It was a big statement. And his mixes tended to be really long. And the, the original flowered up version of this is really good. It's 13 minutes. But he churned, Weatherall churned out two mixes of his own. One being 15 and a half. The other one 17 and a half. You're getting 33 minutes of remix. And they're just journeys. It starts as a dance track, then cuts the tempo down to a hip-hop track and then goes back to being fast and slow and fa it's just man it's a roller coaster of a remix this is so good if i had to make a top five remix ever whether i'll remix top five this would be in the top five maybe even at number one if you enjoy the art of the remix get the original flowered up version and then listen to this this is inspiring shit man if you're thinking about being a remixer or just love remixes, fuck, you got to hear this. If you haven't heard it, man, I envy you. Because you need to hear this. Um, as someone who appreciates the art of the remix, it does not get any better than Flower It Up. Okay. Flower It Up's a weekender. Flower It Up was okay. It's kind of a... Well, anyway, I'll, I'll reserve my opinion on that. This is... Savers of Paradise, Wilmot. This came out on Warp. This is a single, two-tracker. He took a... I don't know, he sampled some Swamp Bayou track from New Orleans with this this crusty haunted horn sample and turned it into this dance vibe, this down-tempo groove. Produced a really horrible video where Weatherall is dancing around the street with like a baton. He looked like a douche. I'm sure he'd be the first one to admit that. Weatherall had a great sense of humor about himself, but the real... The real jam on this single is the B-side. Rumble Summons. Rumble fucking Summons. It sounds nothing like the A-side. It's like this really hard metallic techno. Great song. It's so good. Can't recommend this single enough, but not because of the A-side. Because of the B-side. Alrighty. This one I'm going to hold up just because I love. This is Inner Sphere. This came out on Say Brett's, which was Nina Walsh's label. Label, I think Weatherall and Walsh were together as a couple and then later made music together and were buddies and partners and all that shit. But this is a great single, Out of Body. Weatherall's mix is strange, ambient, down-tempo, experimental weirdness. There I go using weird again, but it is. What are you going to do? This is... Stockwell Steppas. We're getting into the Two Lone Swordsman phase. He he worked that Savers of Paradise angle for a few years, but something we all know knew and loved about Weatherall is he didn't he didn't stay happy very for very long doing one type of music. He had to keep it fresh for himself and for the rest of us. And he did. Anyway, this wasn't the first Two Lone Swordsman. Sorry, these are a little out of order, but um this was, this came out in 1997, and this was sort of the beginning of the Two Lone Swordsman electro, electro days. They had a few years there where they did nothing but electro, which was great too. But this is an excellent, excellent EP on Emissions. After Sabres, Weatherall started a label called Emissions. It had three versions. It was Emission, Emissions Static, Emissions Echoic, and Emissions... I can't remember the other one, but one was more like a dance. Uh, oh, I got it right here. I got, well, I got an emissions one right here, but it's it, one, the static one was dedicated to experimental stuff. Echoic was ex dedicated to dub and then just regular emissions was dedicated to more dancey stuff. At any rate, this came out at emissions and 
It's a double pack of really excellent stuff. This is swimming, not skimming. This is a promo too. This had this comes with a picture cover. I have it somewhere. I don't know where it is, but I guess I have two copies of this. But this this was the emissions label. I think this is this is the uh, static. This is. I guess audio output. I don't know. I can't remember what this one is. It lo-fi, static. Yeah, lo-fi. Echoic. Anyway, this is a double pack of of like noodly housey jams with some remixes on it. Two Lone Swordsman had a period in the mid '90s where they did noodly noodly house and techno, and this is a great example of that. Great record. I like this better than Stockwell Staples actually. Um, yeah. Swimming, not skimming. Now, this is probably, arguably, my favorite Weatherall-related release ever. This is the first two Lone Swordsman album, The Fifth Mission, Return to the Flight Path, Flight Path Estate. This is a triple pack of just really... Those of you who don't think electronic music can be soul music, I, list, I dare you to listen to this and defy you to then think that electronic music cannot be soul music there is some beautiful shit on this album this last song paisley dark itself is worth this purchase this is a beautiful testament to how electronic music can be leaking with soul this is a great album cannot recommend this highly enough some really some really out there dance jams but never too dancey this is just very it's it's head music it's not club music this is an album you sit down and listen to on the headphones and chill out and contemplate your life with uh not to get too pretend pretentious about it but uh yeah yeah this is deep music i can't recommend that one highly enough pick that one up return to the flight path of state people do it i don't care what it costs figure it out and get it because you will not be you will not regret it. This is the 10th mission on Emissions. This came out prior to the album. These records. But there we go. Uh, I think it's, is it upside? Yeah, it's upside down. Sorry about that. Um, the cut on here, though, Rico's Heli. Probably my favorite song they ever did. Rico's Heli is on the album, the Return of the Flight Path of State, but it's a different version. The version here... Dance music doesn't get any more soulful than this, folks. Get this album, or it's an EP, five songs. Beautiful stuff. Rico's Heli makes it worth it. However rare that is and expensive it is, pick it up. This is the third mission. Another, this is a four tracker. I think this might be their first, the first thing they did as Two Lone Swordsman. I could be wrong on that, but this is early days stuff. And this is like the 10th mission and the uh, the 5th mission in that same vein. Um, very noodly electronics, almost jazzy, experimental, um, muffled beats. Hmm. You, put, you take those two EPs and combine it with the album and you've got yourself a couple of hours of like some bomb-ass listening. This is something the Two Lone Swordsman put out as Lino Squares. This is the label it came out on, Humboldt County. Um, but yeah, this is a really excellent double pack of of more banging house music. It's still kind of noodly. It sounds like Tulane Swordsman, obviously, but it's the, the beats are more banging. It's more groovy, a little deeper, strange, deep house music. Excellent. This is, they had a sub-label called Special Emissions. This is a, a track that Tulane Swordsman did with Being. His name was Dave Being. Um, and they released him in these kind of Ziploc bags with these special mission stickers. And they were really limited. It came with like, you know, a boring generic inner sleeve. And then it came with this little picture of press sheet thing, the track listing. This is good. It's kind of strange electronics. Um, I don't know. It's, it's good. Pick it up. Here's another special missions. They did uh, Deanne Day versus Blue. Blue was an, a, a dub band on um, Emissions. They have a great album called Mexican Church, by the way. 
Pick that up if you see it. DN Day was Andy Weatherall and David Harrow. They released stuff under Blood Sugar as well, which I'll talk about here in a minute. This, I think DN, DN Day basically stood for D and A, David and Andy. D and A. Anyway, this is a really limited one-sided 12 inch. Uh, they basically did a house mix of a blue track, deep dubby house, good stuff. Uh, this is this is another Deanne Day single. This is a promo. Lo-fi. There it is. I was right. Lo-fi. Uh, their Deanne Day stuff was, again, just deep, echoey, dub house. Really good. Long, extended workout jams. Stuff you'd play late at night, on, late in a set. Just let it go. Long songs so you can go take a piss. Not worry about it. This is a promo of... I don't know what is this? I wonder if this is a long first Friday they pull the yeah this is the press sheet from white noise the long first Friday and then the b-side hardly breathe that's the cut you want hardly breathe mm. 14 minute deep deep house with some great vocal samples man talk about trance music I don't mean trance and like Paul Oakenfold trance I mean like just Put you in a trance kind of music that's that's the shit oh this is this is the commercial version of what i just showed you i've got two of that um here's the blood sugar again this isn't a very exciting this is a, a, a promo copy of the blood sugar ep this is called levels he did this with david harrow this is just five cuts of really deep um bass heavy house music the bass is just rumbles your guts man I remember playing this in the clubs and, and people would just be, you could feel this, your hair would be shaking and uh, this is bowel quaking music. Music to make you shit. And I mean that in a good way. Shit your pants music. That sounds horrible, but you get my drift, I hope. Let me dig through the stack here. I've got a lot of weather all. Uh, I think I might... Um, Ooh, yes, okay, I want to talk about this one. This, my friends, is about as good as remixes get. This is Two Lone Swordsman versus Primal Scream Stuka. This is when they started going electro. I think this came out in 97 or 98. After they did the Noodley House thing, they, they went the other way and went electro. They amped up the beats. And this is killer. One of the best remixes they ever did. Two just balls out electro tracks. I remember playing that in the club and just scared the shit out of people. There I go again, comparing great music with shitting, but uh, good stuff. You want to check that out. This is the two or uh, two Lone Swordsman mix of Spiritualized come together. You can't really, there's a pill right here, an embossed pill. Those of you who have ladies and gentlemen, we are floating in space will know what I'm talking about. It's a pill. I'll talk, there's another band I'll talk about. I'll pull out all my spiritualized records at some point, but this has Richard Fearless mix, Two Lone Swordsman mix. The Two Lone Swordsman mix is like this 15 and a half minute jazz experimental tip jam that just kills. It's so good. The original version of Come Together is fucking awesome too. One of spiritualized best tracks and then the Swordsman just turn it on its head and turn it into, turn it into something else. This is another group, this is another name they went under, Rude Solo. This is the Two Lone Swordsman. This is pure electro, but I just show, I thought I'd show that as one of their other names they recorded under. Good stuff. Mm. Bag of Blue Sparks. This came out on Warp in 99, I think? 98. 98. This has just got several cuts of just fierce electro so good this is great great stuff impeccably produced uh, keith tenniswood by the way is a phenomenal producer thinking of he him and weather all together is insane think of those two talents making electro music and you've got this uh indescribable music electro at its core but so much more 
This came out the same year. This is Stay Down, also on Warp. This is like, this is a really phenomenal album. I didn't love it at the time, though. Whether I was kind of known of putting out long dance tracks, this came out as a single album. You know, the previous two on Swordsman album was the Return of the Flight Path Estate, which is three three records. This is a single album of 12 tracks, all pretty short, obviously. It's on one album. And it was just, it was different in that way. I remember picking this up, almost being like, where's the other album? How is this not a double, at least? And I, I didn't quite get it at the time. Didn't love it. I, I thought it was okay, but I didn't love it. It's not Electro, like the Bag of Blue Sparks, which came out just a few months before this. But they dropped this, and it was... I don't even want to describe it. It's so many different vibes going on. But over the years, I have a website, too. It's occasionalfeelgood.com. I wrote a review about this, and it might be better described in my review. But this is an album that's really grown on me over the years. I didn't love it then. I love it now. I think a lot of people who like the Swordsman, this is their favorite release, and with good reason. It's hard to describe. Um, deep soul music. Deep. This cover with these deep sea divers, it fits the mood. It's deep. Check that out. Another great album. A Virus with Shoes. Which is a reference, of course, to the late and great Bill Hicks. Another person I need to talk about. I don't want to digress as I think as I think about this. I don't want to digress too much, but I don't see a lot of stand-up comics anymore because the first two stand-up comics I saw were Sam Kinison and Bill Hicks. How do you top those guys? You don't. You you don't. You start your you you start your fandom as a stand-up guy with those two guys, and it's like it's hard to beat those two. Anyway, this is a, a, a crazy EP bizarre it's seemingly influenced by jazz it's got some miles davis samples and samples from electronic bernard sumner from new orders band but just different nothing sounds like this this electronic said it's fine it's soul music again oh. tiny reminders also on warp this is a triple lp of electro insanity they carry a, such a frenetic, intense vibe throughout over 70 minutes of music, and they never falter. This is one of the finest electro releases I've ever heard. And I consider myself to be somewhat of a connoisseur of electro music. This is phenomenal. If you see this, don't hesitate. Just get it. If you want to introduce yourself to music that sounds different, when I picked this up in 2000, it blew my mind, and it still blows my mind. 20 years of mind being blown. Just accept it. Pick it up. I show this because it's, it's, a, personal, it's, a, it's a personal thing. I had Weatherall sign this for me. This is Calexico, a promo 12-inch of Calexico's Crystal Frontier 12-inch. This came out 20 years ago in 2000. Weatherall signed it. Tennis Wood signed it. They do a remix on here. And, you know, I don't remember. It, I got it from the Bywire site. If those of, those of you who used to buy records on the Internet in the late 90s, early 1000s, you might remember the Bywire site. Maybe not. I got it from there, and I don't remember why they signed it. I don't. I just know that he did. That's where I got it. I got it from Bywire, and it means a lot, especially now that he's dead. This is another great remix that they did for a really criminally underrated band, 6x7. This is Eat Junk, Become Junk. One of their great remixes. One of the best. More balls out Electro. But yeah, 6 by is another band I'll talk about at some point. Those guys, man, why they didn't... Why they weren't more popular, I'll never understand. This is Ricardo Villalobos. Um... The uh, Via Lobos remixed Two Lone Swordsman on their Further Reminders EP or LP. I won't talk. It's sitting right here. I won't talk about it. I think maybe they just return the favor and remix Via Lobos here. But this is a great EP. It's a double pack. The Swordsman kind of churned out like a, a rock and roll version of this. As you know, Via Lobos is one of the minimal techno kings, and the Swordsman turned Dexter 
the high point of that album, Alcachofa, and turn it into this rock and roll jam. There, this is a collection of great tracks, by the way. Soul Capsules on this. It was Baby Ford and Thomas Melchar, Melchoir. I don't know how you say his name. Baby Ford's another one I'll talk about that I've got a massive collection of and I absolutely love. But that's that's one well worth picking up in terms of uh, Weatherall history. That is a, um, a great testament into how Weatherall could be so varied and produce pretty much whatever, whatever vibe he wanted to produce. This is a clunk... This is another band that they recorded under the two on Swordsman. This is just like an a EP of Electro, but just another example of one of the names they recorded under. This, I hold this up because it's so fucking good and different from what he normally did. This is Shiesty, Step Back. And I don't have the press release with this anymore. I don't know why, but I remember at the time, I think there's only like 50 of this in existence. 50 which is a crime. This is just filthy, dirty, two-step jungle music. It's so good. It's just completely different to anything Weatherall ever did and why this didn't get a wider, re maybe that's why I didn't get a wider release. The label probably didn't know what the fuck to do with that. Really amazing stuff. This is another insanely rare thing I wanted to show only because the the Swordsman mix is really good. Heliocentric. I think the way I remember this at the time, this came out in 2000, there's only a, an obscenely low number of this, like 75 copies in existence. In fact, I got the... Excuse me while I read the press release here. Maybe it says... Uh, well, the, the press release describes describes it as this. Heliocentric is the standout instrumental track from Paul Weller's current album of the same name and some bright spark got Weatherall and Tennis Wood, a.k.a. the Two Lone Swordsman, to remix it. The result, the result is even better than we could have hoped for. A simply superb live blend of electronic production. They beef up the bass and create a simple driving undertow before mixing in crunchy sub bass, soaring strings, and that ghostly choir. When the double time electronic pulses kick in, you are completely transfixed, hooked to the beat, only to have it disintegrate before you. Nice. It says that. I didn't make up nice. On the flip, you'll find the original is rather fine, too. That's a pretty good way to describe it. I would describe it in one word as like a Krautrock remix. It's electronic, sure. It's funky, sure. But this is the most Krautrocky weather I'll ever got. How this is only on 75 copies, I don't know if that's true. It's Weatherall and Paul Weller together. It's nuts that that's so rare, but there you go. I hold this up because I think it's a good testament to what inspired Weatherall. People wonder what inspired him. This is a good collection. This is 9 o'clock drop on New Phonic. This is a good collection of what inspired him. This has got like 23 Skidoos, Shriek Back, 400 Blows, Quando Quango, um... Let's see. Oh, color boxes on here. Post-punk, new wave, electro, industrial noise. And that makes sense when you think of Weatherall. It's, a, it's basically a, a mishmash of all kinds of different vibes. But it works. It's really good stuff. And here's something. This is something he did with Julian Cope. Um, let me get my hand out of the way there. Uh, the original mix by Julian Cope is kind of crow rocky. As we all know, Julian Cope is one of the, you know, one of the foremost worldly kraut rock connoisseurs. And then Weatherall turns it into his, kind of does his disco dub thing on the B-side. I think this came on white. Yeah, white. I, by the way, I don't give a shit what color my vinyl is. In fact, I avoid anything that's not black. I don't have a huge problem with colored vinyl, but... I think people get a little too crazy about it. Um, just give me the music. That's all I really care about at the end of the day. I really don't give two shits what color the record is. You know what I'm saying? So, in his later years, Weatherall started... He had this, he had this way of always changing up his vibe. He'd do techno, and then house, and then electro, and 
rockabilly. I'm not going to cover his rockabilly stuff because I didn't love that. After the rockabilly phase, he started doing like a disco dub thing. And he never really left that, which is kind of a bummer. I kept waiting for him to change up his tune. But for like the last 10 years or so of his career, he sort of churned out the disco dub thing, which is no bad thing. But this is... Andy Weatherall versus the boardroom. This is a test pressing. It's not an exciting cover, but um, this is a good example of where he started to kind of go into a more disco dub thing. Um, there are remixes from him and then some other... God, I can't, I can't remember the other people on here, but there's no credits on this. But this is a good collection of, of where he... It's a good, uh, it's a good representation of where his style was the last 10 years of his life. This is another good representation of this. Cut, copy, sun god. He's, he does two mixes here that are similar, but, but different. I would highly recommend picking this up and mixing the two tracks into each other. It's like nine minutes per mix. So you mix them together, obviously it's 18 minutes. But I, I use Audacity to do my mixes and I sort of spliced them together and turned it into one gigantic mix. He kind of, I honestly, I haven't even heard the original version. I don't like cut copy, really. Um, I've only really heard these two mixes. Really good stuff, though. Um, just up-tempo, bright, impeccably produced disco music for the 21st century. You know what I'm saying? This is something he did with Nina Walsh, another group he recorded under the Woodley Research Facility. This is on Rodder's Golf Club. He put out a number of things on Rodder's Golf Club. That was his label after uh, emissions. It was essentially, initially meant to be an electronic or electro only thing. And then he went to this, Rodder's Golf Club. This is not electro at all. This is disco dub goodness, some rock influence mixed in there. One of his later releases. This is another compilation he put out called Masterpiece. Um, this is a, gr a really, really um, thoughtful collection of stuff that not only influenced Weatherall, but his own work as well. It came out on a triple CD with an infinitely larger track list. It's all mixed, though. The cool thing about this vinyl version is all these tracks are unmixed, so you get them in their full, unedited glory. It's a nice package, too. It's a trifold. It folds out a few times. The wax is finely pressed. I would recommend picking that up. This is something you did with Timothy, Timothy J. Fairplay. This is the Asphodels. Ruled by passion, destroyed by lust. It's a double pack on Rodder's Golf Club. And Tim Fairplay is one of those guys who's been rocking that John Carpenter soundtrack synth vibe. That's kind of what this has. Picture a John Carpenter soundtrack with more of a disco vibe. I know John Carpenter is very disco anyway, but this is more so. But this is, I highly recommend picking this up. I think this came out in 2013, I want to say. Let me see. Oh, 2012. God, it's been out that long. This is a remix accompaniment to that, too. Basically, the songs on the album I just showed you get remixed here by people like Black... Black Merlin and Justin Robertson of Lion Rock. Getting toward the end here. This is something he did in 2017. He reunited with Yellow. It's Project Fratonium. He took this three-minute Yellow song, which is good, and he turned it into 40 minutes of mixes. Four mixes. One's like a techno vibe, one's a house vibe, one's an electro vibe, and another one's an ambient vibe. He just completely dismantled the song. And churned out a full album's worth of remixes of a three-minute track. Part of Weatherall's magic. He could do that kind of thing and make it work. I'm going to end on this one. This was his last solo album he put out. And there he is. There's his bearded grill. Pretty much what he looked like the day he died. This came out in 2018, I want to say. I don't know. This has been out for a few years. I don't love this album. It's not bad. I've listened to it once and filed it away. I don't know that I'll ever listen to it again. But I show this uh, I show this because there he is. He is no more. 
So yeah, I'm well over an hour right now. Again, I've only I've only touched a very small amount of of records. I mean, I'm looking through my collection here and oh, like Mad Monks on Zinc, Savers of Paradise mix, mm. Red Snapper, Savers of Paradise mix. It never stops. This guy just uh, did tons of stuff that was great, but. Um, as someone who loves music and someone who's been a DJ and someone who takes record collecting very seriously, Weatherall was the guy I looked up to. He was more, influ more influential on me just as a music fan than any person in history. He just was so prolific, but everything he did had such soul to it and so much charisma. And he was such a cool person with such a great sense of humor with a complete inability to take himself seriously, being involved in this industry that takes itself very seriously, for him to be able to mix all these things and balance it out where he was very zen about it. Because he didn't start off as zen. He was a crazy, coked up weirdo in the, in the early days. He's still a nice guy, but I met him once. So I clearly don't know him, but the way he came off was just this very kind, understanding, fan of music who happened to be in a position to create as well and the stuff he created is unforgettable It'll always be unforgettable to me and it's clearly unforgettable to the rest of the music world but what he did for me mainly was just be a stellar human being at the end of the day that's all you can do if you can be a highly creative individual and make stunning music year in and year out and be a hell of a nice guy what more can you ask? Andy Weatherall. So there it is. There's my there's my Weatherall video. Like I mentioned before, I have thousands of records in my collection that I'll talk about. Um, the majority of my collection is from the 80s and 90s, especially the 90s. I have a ton of electronic stuff, but also jazz and punk and rock. I've got a lot of stuff. So um, I'll be back to talk about other things as time permits in my life, but thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. I know there's a shitload of YouTube videos out there. I can't even find the time to watch the videos I want to watch. So those of you who hung with me through this video, I really appreciate it because your time, that's the most precious commodity on this planet as far as I'm concerned is time. So if there's anything I didn't talk about or if there are other Weatherall records you'd like me to hold up and show, I'll, I can do that in another video. Please leave your comments. I love reading comments. I have a thick skin, so let me have it. If I'm not doing something you want, let me have it. I, I love constructive criticism or just criticism. I enjoy it. I think that makes us better as people, being able to recognize your faults. I do that pretty well. So again, thank you so much for tuning in today. And uh, until the next video.